Hello, and welcome back to Maturing the Bride. We are on book six. We're in the final chapter of asking the question, how is God going to choose his bride? In chapter one, we discovered that all Christians are going to be judged twice. We call them J1 and J2. They have two different purposes. J1 is to determine, are you a believer? And J2 asks the question, do you get rewards? We then looked at 10 differences between J1 and J2 in chapter 2. We then went to J3 asking the question, will my sin come up at J2? And the answer is, nothing comes up at J1 and no confessed sin will be brought up at J2. Chapter 3 then says, what criteria will God use to judge us at J2? And we looked at seven criteria that God uses at J2. We then went on to chapter 5. And we said what the Apostle Paul didn't know about all future believers. And that is the fact that with freedom, with the fact that our sins have been nailed to the cross, comes choices. And Paul did not know which way his future followers, disciples, whatever, which way they would choose. Would it be the small, narrow road? Or would it be the broad, wide road that leads to dysfunctionality? He didn't know. As a result, many times he used subjunctive verbs, expressing a wish or a possibility about our future inheritance. But then in chapter 6, we said, no, 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 there are places in the Bible that guarantees our rewards. But when we look at it, we find out it's always in the context of works. In the context of works, the Bible guarantees rewards. So now we're at chapter 7, our final chapter in the series. And the question is this, should the church be more focused on J1 or J2? If you'll remember in chapter two, I talked to you about sitting down with my pastor, the church that I was attending at the time, and going over the concepts of J1 and J2 with him. They were very new to him, but he was very intrigued and he liked what he was hearing. But at the end of our time together, he asked the most significant question he could have asked. He asked this, Bob, should the church be more focused on J1 or J2? And if you'll recall, I didn't give you the answer. How rude. <laughs> I was talking to another pastor more recently about this concept. He said these words, I can tell you what the Bible is primarily about. I said, oh yeah, what's that? He said, saving people from hell. He was focused entirely on J1. He felt the Bible was primarily about saving people from hell. Men and women, I want to lovingly disagree with that. I want to lovingly disagree with that. In fact, I will say it up plainly. The Bible is not primarily about saving people from hell. Where do we get that from? Well, we get it from 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. And in looking at the word of all, all scripture, and then looking what it does not say and what it does say, it clears things up. Let's look at it together. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching and reproof and for correction and for training in righteousness. That, that, uh-oh, purpose statement. All scripture is here for a purpose, that or so that. What's the scripture here for? So that, what's it say? People don't go to hell. Uh, wrong. It doesn't say that. But what a perfect place for it to say that. Why doesn't it say all scripture is here so that people don't have to go to hell? If you've been following our teaching and watched everything, men and women, I'm here to tell you Christianity is not primarily about saving people from hell. It is not primarily about saving people from hell. So what does it say? It says these words, that... The man of God may be complete. Okay, let's stop right there. Complete, whole, mature. He doesn't want us to say as little babies. He wants us to mature that we may be complete. Keep going. That the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. <gasps> equipped for every good work? Hey, 
That's works oriented. Yeah. The Bible is primarily about J2. It's primarily worried about your presentation to God to be holy and blameless, full of good works at J2. Men and women, the Bible is not primarily about saving people from hell. But why? Why is it primarily about J2? Well, the answer should be obvious at this point. <laughs> God is looking for a bride for his son. And that's going to be determined based on our good works. It has nothing to do with getting into heaven. That is solely by faith and faith alone. It has everything to do with your good works. And God's primary goal is to get a bride for his son. That is what he's shooting for. Hence, as we've seen before with the Apostle Paul, Colossians 1, 28, Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. Paul said, my goal is to make you mature. That's my goal, to make you mature. Now notice this word, present. Pre Do you think he's talking about presenting us before J1 or J2? Well, it can't be J1 because Jesus says we've passed out of judgment. We've passed out of J1. Paul is referencing J2. He says, my goal is to present you mature at J2. Men and women, that is why the Bible highlights good works over and over and over again. That is why the Bible is full of works. We talked about that in the last book. It's full of grace and it's full of works. Yes, the works is referencing J2. Look at Psalm 37 verse 3, full of works. Trust in the Lord and what? Do good. Uh, that sounds works oriented. Yeah. Yeah, God wants you to do good. That's his goal. Why? He's looking for a bride for his son. He wants to see people who are going to do good. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Faithfulness? Not just faith. No, faith goes with J1. Faithfulness goes with J2. Befriend faithfulness. Acts chapter 10 verse 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. He went about doing good. Jesus, our example, went about and did good. He went about and did good. What can you do that's good today? What can you do? What could you do tonight? What could you do tomorrow? What could you do at the office? What could you do at school? What could you do to a friend? What could you do to a neighbor? What could you do that's good? That's what God wants from us. He wants us to do good. Galatians chapter 6 verse 10. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Let us do good. Oh, there's that good part. Let us do good to everyone. Do good that sounds works, right? Yeah, I don't have to belabor this. I hope I don't. Doing good does not get you into heaven. It does get you rewards, and it helps you to become a part of the bride. Do good. Luke chapter 6, verse 35. But love your enemies and do good and lend expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Do good and rewards. A direct link between good deeds and rewards. Yep, it's all there. It's all coming together. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 6. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for with such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Do not neglect to do good. Be a do-gooder. Be a do-gooder. Do good things. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 11. Let him turn away from evil. And do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. Do good. Turn away from evil and do good. God doesn't just want you in sin management. We talked about that in book number one. It's not about sin management. It's about doing good. Doing good. That's what God wants. Doesn't just want sin management. He wants you doing good deeds. Titus chapter 3 verse 8. The saying is trustworthy and I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. 
to be careful to devote themselves to good works. Be careful? This sounds pretty serious. It is. God wants us to be careful to do good works. And then he says, this is profitable. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. You bet it's profitable. You're going to get to rule and reign with Christ forever. That's extremely profitable. Therefore, be careful. Be careful to do good works. Titus chapter 2, verse 14. Who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness. Of course, speaking about Christ, your Christ gave himself for us. And to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Zealous for good works. Do you wake up in the morning and say, I, I just, I want to do some good things. I want to do some, I'm zealous to do good. That's what God wants from us. That's what he's hoping for in us, that we would be zealous for good works. And we just say, I just want to make God look good. I want to do something that's going to make God look good. James chapter 1, verse 27. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God, the Father, is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. To visit orphans and widows in their affliction? Hey, that sounds like doing good. Yeah. That's what true religion is. Doing good things. 3 John 1.11. Beloved, do not imitate evil, but imitate good. Whoever does good is from God. Be a do-gooder. Be a do-gooder. That's what God wants. He wants us to do good things. Place our faith in him for our salvation and do good things. 1 Timothy 6, 17 and 18. As for the rich in this present age. Okay, stop right there. As for the rich, the multimillionaires, right? No, 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 no. Men and women, if you live in the United States, you are rich. I don't care what you have. You are rich. Why? I have been around the world and I know people who have one set of clothings on their back and they wake up every morning and pray, God, where am I going to get food today? That is their lifestyle. We, we are rich. So this is for us. This passage Paul is writing to us. He's saying, hey, tell the rich people these things. Here it goes. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good and to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, to do good, to be rich in good works. And if you remember, all of that will prepare them a foundation, a foundation that they will build upon for all of eternity future. Do good Works be rich in good works to build up your foundation. First Peter 4. Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will. Okay, stop right there. S suffer according to God's will? You mean it can be God's will for us to suffer? It's not me saying it's Peter. It's right there in the text. And in the context of suffering, look at these words. Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Even if I'm suffering, God wants me to do good. That's what he's saying. He wants you to get a positive resume. <laughs> he wants you to build up your resume for J2, men and women. This is what life is all about. Work at it. Devote yourself. Be zealous. Be careful to do good works. Hmm. So, what kind of good works can you do? Oh, glad you asked that question. <laughs> Steve Shogren, not related to me, same last name. We came from the same village in Sweden about six generations ago. There were so many Janssens in one part of the small village. Half of them switched to Huegren, which is Shogren. That's his heritage. That's my heritage. I call him a distant cousin. Anyhow, my daughter and I visited him in California when we were at a homeschool convention. This is a picture of them with my daughter, Elise. He authored a book called Changing the World Through Kindness. 
And he basically says, you need to go out as a church and do random acts of kindness. That will build God's reputation up and that will draw people to your church. And so he has a whole ministry toward this. And so I wrote a bunch of these in our middle school curriculum. We have middle school curriculum for middle schoolers, a Bible program for homeschoolers. And so in that, I listed a bunch of things. I'm going to go over just a, a couple of them very quickly. Here's one that he said that he loved. Fruit giveaway. He writes these words. I was surprised at the popularity of this one. People really like fresh fruit and they will readily take it. I have tried this one across the U.S. and it has gone over great guns. An orange, an apple, and a banana is enough along with a connection card in a clear plastic bag. It works well door to door. A connection card, putting a card in there with your church's name on it, times of services, where it's located, etc. So they can say, wow, who, who is this church? Well, who does these good deeds? I want to go get to know them. So, fruit giveaway. Another one, he says, raking leaves. We came, we saw, we raked. Several people in a small group can rake an entire neighborhood on a single Saturday morning. Maybe you don't like raking your own yard, but when you're with a group of friends serving in the name of Christ, a chore becomes a joy. Many yards take only 15 to 20 minutes to polish off. What a great idea. Grab some people and go rake leaves for the glory of God to make him famous. Messy kitchen cleanup. Some who have been sick or depressed might need a good kitchen cleaning. Don't try this one by yourself. Two or three can clean up a super dirty kitchen on a Saturday morning. Here's another one, lawn mowing. Several mowers make mowing the lawn short work. Look for long grass, knock on the door, and go for it. Here's a simple one, changing light bulbs. Sounds simple, but for some, reaching up to a nine-foot ceiling is a difficult chore. Replace burned out ones, knock on elderly doors, and see if there is a need. Men and women, I encourage you to get his book, Changing the World Through Kindness. He has numerous creative ideas in there, practical, everyday things you can do, doing good works that make God famous, that glorify him. Our church every other month has an outreach to the homeless in the Richmond area. I joined him this one time, and as we went there, we served water and food, chips, drinks, and one of the guys had fished all year, and he had tons of fish fillets. They fried them that morning. We gave them out. And it was a wonderful way to be sharing with the community and letting them know. Men and women, good works permeates the scriptures. Why? because it's primarily about J2. We've already passed out of J1. It's primarily about J2. Well, understanding the differences between J1 and J2 is so helpful. But if you don't understand it, oh, men and women, there are big challenges for the church and for pastors and for the congregation. Let's do a review between these two. If you recall, J1 is primarily about what God does for us. J2 is about what we can do for God. Now, here's where the challenges come in. Men and women, I want to challenge you. Most worship songs on a Sunday morning are focused on J1. They're focused on J1. Things like, He took away my sins. He takes away my shame. He will move the mountain. He will break my chains. These are all excellent songs. They're great songs. They talk about the glory of God, but it's all about J1. Men and women, these songs are not incorrect. They are incomplete. And so you've got the whole audience for 10, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, for some 25 minutes, focused on J1. Then the pastor comes along and gives a J2 message. I was at a sermon where the pastor gave an excellent J2 message. It was just an incredible. It was about reaching the nations. It was phenomenal. I loved it. I was so excited. And when it came to the end of his message, guess what? He gave a J1 invitation. Hey, maybe you don't know Jesus. And people are sitting there scratching their head. Do I have to go to the nations to, to be a Christian? I thought it was all about faith. I... Do I have to quit my job and go to Bible school to prepare to be a missionary? I mean, something's not clicking here. Why? He never differentiated between J1 and J2. And they usually do that because they believe the Bible is primarily about saving people from hell. And then if you want to complicate things, good night. If you think you can lose your salvation, oh, it all goes out the window. Why? People in the church may have lost it from the past week, so you have to keep that, giving that invitation over and over and over and over and over 
again. And people are saying, well, I gave my life to Jesus, but he's giving these sermons about this way of walking with him. And, but I'm walking with him, I think, but I'm, and though it's just confusing. And then many times, 95% of the time, the closing song is focused on J1. It's focused on J1. J2 message, J1 closing. Men and women, this is why there is conflicting, confusing communication in the church. Conflicting, confusing communication inside the church. We've never differentiated clearly between J1 and J2. My wife brought up a phenomenal question when reviewing the material that I teach, and she asked this question. She said, when 95% of your Sunday morning audience is saved, which should you focus more on, J1 or J2? I thought, that's a great way of phrasing it. If the majority of your people have a relationship with God, should you focus more on J1 or J2? And we're saying, oh, please, please, J2. Men and women, when you can see the difference, when you can separate J1 from J2, the scriptures are so much easier to understand. So that when you're reading the Bible and you see works pop up, you say, oh, that's J2. That's J2. When you see something conditional in the Bible, you say, oh, that's J2. That's J2. When you see something about faith, oh, that's J1. That's J1. The Bible is so much easier to understand when you differentiate between these two. All right, well, let's wrap up the lecture. We're not going to look for Waldo. We're going to look for the J's, J1 and J2. Again, we're going to go over three passages. These are the three final passages for the series. Passage number one comes from Ezekiel, chapter 16, verses 59 and 60. For thus says the Lord God, I will deal with you as you have done, you who have despised the oath and breaking the covenant. Yet I will remember my covenant with you in the days of your youth, and I will establish for you an everlasting covenant. Five. Four, three, two, one. Do you see him? A little tricky here. J1, yet I will remember my covenant with you. This is the covenant that he's given to Abraham. I'm going to be yours. I'll bless you and you'll be a blessing. I'll remember that. I'll always remember my relationship with you. But J2, a little difficult. Yet you have despised the oath in breaking the covenant. This is J2 in a negative sense. They were supposed to do good works, but they did not. And that's what he's referencing. You didn't do good works. You should have, but you did not. That's J2. All right, passage number two. Matthew chapter 6, verse 12. And forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. That's an easy one. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Ha, ha. J1, forgive us our debts. J2, as we have forgiven our debtors. Very easy. Passage number three comes from... Zechariah chapter 3, 4 through 7. And the angel came to those who were standing before him, remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, Behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you with pure vestments. And I said, Let them put a clean turban on his head. And the angel of the Lord solemnly assured Joshua, Thus says the Lord of hosts, If you walk in my ways and keep my charge, then you shall rule my house and have charge of my courts, and I will give you the right of access among those who are standing here. Big passage. Five, four, three, two, one. Of course, the very first part was J1. Remove the filthy garments from him. Behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you with pure vestments. J2. If, uh-oh, conditionality. Yeah, you see anything conditional, that's J2. If you walk in my ways and keep my charge, then you shall rule my house and have charge of my courts. So oh, ruling and reigning. Have we heard that somewhere before? Yeah. Yeah. Over the universe as a part of the bride of Christ. It was in the Old Testament. Rule my house and have charge of my courts and I will give you the right of access among those who are standing here. Okay. Let's review. We're asking a final question. Should the church be more focused on J1 or J2? Men and women, I want to challenge you. When 95% of your Sunday morning audience is saved, please, please focus on J2 and talk about it as J2. Why? He will choose his son's bride based on works. Your goal, my goal, 
our believers, our fellow believers' goal, those we see around us in a church on Sunday morning, our goal for them should be these words, to hear from Jesus, well done, good and faithful servant. Well, I hope this whole book was helpful for you. We get a new book. What are we going to do in the next book? In our next book, we're going to go over the biggest set of works God has given us to do. And you're going to discover something I call the story of the Bible. The story, a story that starts in Genesis, runs through to Revelation, is one cohesive thing, the story of the Bible. The biggest set of works God has given us to do. Thank you for watching Maturing the Bride. Hey everyone, I hope J1 and J2 has been extremely helpful for you. I know it has helped many people over the years that I've taught it to, and I certainly know it has helped me. <laughs> Just as a reminder, it is a part of a bigger series called Maturing the Bride. Please be sure you watch the other books to help you get the big picture of what God is doing. And always remember, Unveiling Glory is a 501c3 nonprofit organization seeking to have a global impact on the church. If you want to help get the message of J1 and J2 out to other nations, please consider giving a tax-free donation to keep spreading this message and to keep this teaching free. Go to www.givetoug.com. Thanks, and please pass this message on to others.